I'm glad that you brought up the justice system, just because I think that this is one uh, interesting dimension of Sapolsky's account that has some very real world consequences. So yeah. because he believes that n nobody is ultimately morally responsible for their actions in a meaningful sense, this calls for an extreme reformation of the justice yeah. system. Yeah. And he thinks of it as, I think he, he refers to it as maybe like the quarantine model. Yes, that's uh, very similar to Greg Caruso and, and Dirk Parabu's yes, yes. model. Yes. Yes, but he, he, that he absolutely sense. doesn't work. Oh, um, okay. so well, just let me let me finish and flesh it yeah, out though, yeah, for yeah, our yeah, listeners. Yeah. In that he thinks that if somebody commits a crime, they are not morally responsible for it, no matter how gruesome it is, because it is their actions were caused by all sorts of things in the past that they cannot be responsible for, and consequently, as opposed to giving them a bona fide punishment. We should adopt a far more extreme version, for instance, of the the Scandinavian criminal system, where they're given uh, essentially like amusement parks to to live in, where they're they're safe from, or the rest of society is safe from them, but they can exhibit as much freedom as possible, and maybe that that word uh, that word's mine, I think here, as much freedom as they want, as long as they're not hurting other people. Hmm. Well, um, I've argued that quarantine systems work when they work, because if you are required to be quarantined for one reason or another, and you refuse, physical force will be used to quarantine you. And if you fight back, they, you will be punished. You can't have quarantine without punishment. I mean... You can't have law without punishment. Law without punishment is just, those aren't laws, those are recommendations. And uh, I think this idea that, that it is humane to abandon law and order is extremely unimaginative and ill-considered. Um, Anybody who's ever lived in a failed state knows you really want law and order. It's what lets you go out at night and not worry about your safety. It allows you to take on long-term projects, you know, building a business, um, buying a house, planting an orchard. All, all the long-term projects we have depend on the security and the reliability of law and order. But you can't have law without punishment. Now, the punishments that we have are obscene. We could do, as the Swedish, as the Scandinavians do, we could do with a lot less punishment. But it's still punishment, and it still should be something that people don't want. That's what punishment is. And it's Notice that self-controlled people, among the tricks they often adopt, is punishing themselves for things that they do when they know they shouldn't do them. And they exhort themselves and scold themselves. And it works. Not always. But if you've never scolded yourself, you've either led a very sheltered life without much daring or adventure, uh, or you, you may not be as uh, trustworthy and reliable a citizen as you think you are. I have the sense that the Scandinavian countries have much less crime than a place like I the United do, States. I think they do, yes. I think but they I've, do. But I wonder if there would be even less if their justice system was more harsh on offenders. But I have no idea. Well, I I don't know. They I think they they've tuned it pretty well, and I'd like to see us move to a similar system. And I'm 
in in my book Freedom Evolves, I, I had a sort of litmus test for what a good theory of punishment, a good system of punishment should be. The ideal. In the ideal system, the punished culprit should be motivated to say, thanks, I needed that. And if you've ever said that, meant that, or thought that, yeah. And every reformed criminal, and there are reformed criminals, can say and mean sincerely, thanks, I needed that. Interesting. So it sounds like your idea, your ideal sort of uh, penal system involves a retributive component, but also a rehabilitative component. So that well, at the, the end. Oh, go the, ahead. The word ret retribution is, I think, often misused. Okay. Charity and retributive justice is, I think, uh, bizarre, not indefensible. There's there's punishment. Now that does punishment mean re retribution? No, retribution I think strictly means to use Kant's own exam uh, that even if there was not going to be any society in the future, even if if the world was going to end, we should round up and punish. You know, we should execute the murderers. We should punish the criminals. There would be no point in that. The only point of punishment is to create credibility and stability in the law, in the agreements that we have. And if, if there's no future, then there's no point in punishment. That's retributivism is when you punish completely independently of any future benefit for anybody. And I think that's a typically inflated philosophical idea. It's, it's absolutist where you don't want to be absolutist. Thanks. I think that, that was an important clarification of what I was saying. So then maybe I should say your ideal form of punishment involves forward-looking, future-looking punishment and a rehabilitative component. So, oh, sure. Yeah. So not just is it good for society as, whole, as a whole, but we want it to serve the individual yeah. as well. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, actually, the example that I like the best, and, but you know, I'm, I may have a tin year or something because I, I, it doesn't seem to have the grip on people that I think it should, is in sports. Um, would you eliminate um, the penalty box from ice hockey? Would you would you eliminate the flagrant foul rule in the NHL? Would you eliminate penalties for unnecessary roughness in in football? I don't think so. They serve important purposes. They're punishments, and and we wouldn't want the umpires and the referees not to treat them as punishments. Uh, I remember in my bridge playing days in college that the general rule was we play strictly by the rules. That way, no arguments break out. We obey all the rules of playing bridge very strictly. Anybody gets caught reneging or signaling to their partner something very bad. And then you can have a really friendly game of bridge. And similarly, uh, we wouldn't want the umpire in a baseball game deliberately calling strikes because the pitcher's mother is in the audience. No. 
We want the umpire to call balls and strikes by the rules. And it would the game wouldn't be worth playing if they didn't do that. Now we temper justice with mercy, and a lot of the condemnation and blame that goes along with retributive views of punishment can be set aside. As it is very often in tort law, my colleague Evan Kelly has a wonderful book called The Limits of Blame, which looks at this closely. Uh, and you can be found at fault, but not and, and assessed damages, but not blamed, not punished. Uh, and that's a good system. We can we could scale back our uh, uh, our delight. This is a point I know that Sapolsky makes much of the the fact that we we relish punishing our enemies. We relish hurting those that hurt us. I view that as one of nature's wiser innovations, harnessing, harnessing that natural vengeful tendency, but harnessing it, taming it, exploiting it. Let's, let's recognize that this is a force that can be used for good. Disapproval. Very powerful force.